It's the first time I've ever given a formal lecture via Zoom, so I hope it all goes well. Second thing I'd like to say is to thank very much my Italian colleague, Marcello Mollica from Sicily, who I'd worked with for 20 years. And it was really he who introduced me to the Italian dimension um, on Irish affairs. So that's uh, maybe very, very important to give him due credit. Um, he, he has also worked in Ireland and we've both written on Ireland in the past together. Main theme of my, my talk this evening is how important Italy was and events in Italy in the 19th century were to understanding what happened in Ireland. Now, there's a, a terrible tendency as um, historians like Sean Connolly and Liam Kennedy often make to see Ireland in some sort of grand isolation uh, that it's um, somehow everything that happens in Ireland is purely a result of internal Irish affairs, except of course the occasional malign influence of the British. Um, in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. When you look at the broad sweep of Irish history, um, it fits into the broad sweep of European history. Uh, it might be sort of almost, if you like, at the end of the line, but essentially uh, it followed broad European trends. So just as um, the, the Williamite Wars in the 1690s were an extension of the European wars, when you look at what happened in Ireland in the 19th century, it's an extension of what was going on in Europe as a whole. Uh, the battle between religion and science, uh, the battle between modernity and progress on the one hand and reaction on the other hand, uh, particularly the rise of nationalism as a political force. Uh, these were all fundamentally novel ideas in the 19th century. And it's only if you can put Ireland into that context you really start to understand uh, how uh, events in Ireland unfolded. And at this stage, I'm going to have to say something to Jason, if you're there. Jason? Yes, I'm, I'm here. I'm, I'm here. getting my slides to do. Have you done something? If you, if you click on your screen, it should reactivate your screen, and then you should be able to navigate through them with your space bar or with your mouse. Ah. Got it, right. There you are. Okay. It's just, it just went to sleep. That's all it was. Ah, right. Okay, thank you. Okay. Well, first and most important character to, uh, to begin this talk with uh, is Cardinal Cullen, Cardinal Paul Cullen. He is the fundamental link between events in Italy and events in Ireland. Um, in many ways, you could say he almost single handedly transformed the Roman Catholic Church in the third quarter of the 19th century and made it a thoroughly modern ultramontane church as against the old Gallic church that had long existed in Ireland. So first, a little bit of the background of Cullen. Um, ironically, he went to a Quaker school and then he went to Carlo College. His family were wealthy farmers in County Meath and uh, they appear to have very good relations with their Protestant neighbors. So he came from uh, a well-to-do background that got on well with his Protestant neighbors, which was not unusual at that time. However, in 1821, um, he goes to the, attend the Propaganda College in Rome. And from 1821 until 1849, he stays in Rome. He makes his early career in Rome. And by all accounts, Rome took him over rather than uh, him taking a bit of Ireland to Rome. It was totally the other way. The Propaganda College, of course, was the, the central organ of the Roman Catholic Church, the propagation of faith uh, and, uh, and uh, through, through, throughout the world. So it was a very central and important college within uh, the Vatican system. Very quickly, when he was at Rome, uh, Cullen found himself very attracted to the conservatives. Uh, the conservatives in Rome were becoming increasingly strong throughout the 1820s. And this is the importance of where you have to understand events in Italy, which I'll come on to in a second. But <clears throat> revolution was in the air in the 1820s. Uh, Cullen had an abhorrence of revolution. He had an abhorrence of secret societies. 
and he had an abhorrence of violence, which made him a very conservative person because most of the progressive movements at that time tended to be associated with the revolutionary wing. And during that period of the 1820s, he becomes converted to what's known as ultramontanism. Now, ultramontanism was an idea that grew up in the 18th century within the Catholic Church. It, it literally means beyond the high mountain, which means Rome. The idea of absolute total discipline and subordination to Rome. Now, Rome should rule and everybody should obey exactly what Rome says and what Rome wants. Now, this is a contradistinction to what was known as the Gallic Church that have long existed in places like uh, France and, and also in Ireland. Uh, and, and many of the Protestant countries as well, because the Gallic Church worked very much on the basis of, we've got to live with prods. So let's, let's try and rub along with them. Let's try and see if we can do, um, you know, make deals, come to agreements uh, so that we can live together. You know, we don't actually have to be fighting all the time. So it was very much therefore left to the local churches, uh, what we might now call national churches, uh, to come to agreements with the local state uh, as to how and why, how things should be done, not to challenge established authorities. If the established state was Protestant, you accepted that, you didn't try to change it. The quid pro quo was that the Protestant state would then leave you alone to do your own thing, as long as you kept your people quiet and you know, didn't create any trouble, then everybody got along reasonably nicely. So Gallicism was particularly associated with Ireland, obviously, because it was part of a Protestant state. Um, and Gallican, Gallicism reigned within Ireland right up until Colin returns in 1849. Now, back to um, Colin in, uh, in, in Italy again. 1821, there were a series of revolts uh, in, in, our, uh, in, in Italy, particularly directed against the Catholic Church. Uh, the rise of what's known as the Young Italy Movement, uh, later referred to as the Risorgimento, which was the unification of Italy. Uh, it was part of the general European movement towards nationalism. Nationalism in turn was associated with liberalism and tolerance and democracy. And of course, those are ideals that are very difficult to square with ultramontanism. Ultramontanism is uh, no tolerance, no liberal democracy, uh, the absolute right of Rome, the papacy, to dictate and to tell you what to do. <clears throat> So the, these recalled the, the Jacobin ideas of the early sense of part of the uh, French Revolution. And this, these um, attacks, these violent attacks against the Catholic Church during the 18, 1820s, uh, obviously played a very important part in turning uh, Cullen towards ultramontanism. And Ultramontanism also emphasized very strongly the ideas of indifference to religion was a major error and toleration was a major error. He studies at the uh, papal, the, sorry, the propaganda college, and particularly during the period 1828 to 1829, uh, he gained the confidence of Pope Leo XII on Irish affairs. In fact, he became very much the Irish spokesman in Rome. Uh, he kept in constant contact with his family back in Ireland, regular communication with friends there. So he was always very, very up to date on Irish affairs. And Leo XII came very heavily to re rely on Cullen to keep him informed of what was going on. Then in 1829, in Northern Italy, uh, there were major revolts, uh, again, part of the European revolutionary tradition. There were major revolts in uh, France, in Poland, uh, in Italy. These were all nationalist revolts uh, advocating liberalism and democracy. They very specifically often targeted the Roman Catholic Church. 
because Rome was associated with the Ancien Regime, uh, the old order which the French Revolution had overthrown. And you have to remember, it's only in 1815 that the Ancien Regime becomes re-established in Europe under the Congress of Vienna. Uh, and it's almost seen as trying to put the clock back as though 1789 had never happened. And because Rome is seen as one of the great pillars of the Ancien Regime, it therefore evokes great hatred from the revolutionaries. Um, Colin himself feared that um, the church itself and many of the powers were being far too conciliatory with the revolutionaries. He went for a very hard line. And this is when he started to become convinced that if you give way to any of the revolutionaries, if you concede even the slightest thing to them, uh, they'll just take what, give them an inch and they'll take a mile. <clears throat> The second reason why uh, the North Italian revolts had a major influence on Cullen is because young, the Young Ireland movement was very influenced by events in Italy, particularly the Young Italy movement. So you get the Young Italians, you get the, the Young Irish, uh, this young movement everywhere across Europe. It's part of that reawakening of the, some of the Napoleonic ideals. <clears throat> In 1830, uh, Gregory XVI becomes Pope, and he very specifically revives Ultramontanism, which Leo XII had been a little bit lax about. He wasn't that too bothered about Ultramontanism, but Gregory, because of the revolutionary movement, became a very firm supporter of the Ultramontane movement, and also uh, Thomas philosophy. Uh, otherwise known as scholastic philosophy. Now, this really was almost, if you like, many ways going almost back to the medieval times. If you want to look up scholastic philosophy in any textbook, it's under the heading of medieval philosophy. And the thing about scholasticism is it tends to work by um, posing an axiomatic truth that something just is. And then you argue down from that to try and make everything fit into it so that you have a pre-existing set of assumptions that everything that then happens in the world, all activity and movement, must be interpreted within those existing assumptions. Um, it's called Thomas philosophy uh, because it was Thomas Aquinas who introduced it into the Roman Catholic Church in the 12th century. And a an important part of Thomas philosophy was that the Roman Catholic Church is revealed truth. Full stop, it is the revealed truth. Okay. So therefore, within Catholic theology, uh, everything has to fit in to the way the Roman Catholic Church sees the world. So you can now see this fitting in with ultramontanism. It's, it's the two are logical extensions of each other. <clears throat> this in turn becomes an important part of the absolutist role of the Pope. The Pope's absolute monarch absolute spiritual monarch and temporal monarch. And the temporal monarchy is very important here because the Pope was the temporal monarch of the papal states, which were the second largest state in Italy. Italy at the time was 12 separate independent states. And the papacy was the second largest one and it straddled the whole of the middle of Italy. So if you wanted, an, if you wanted a united Italy, You've got to take the papal states away from the Pope. Yeah. Um, however, Colin totally supports Gregory the, the 16th, becomes very close to him again, and he totally supports uh, probably two of the most <laughs> outstanding uh, acts of Gregory's reign as Pope. The first was to ban railways, and the second was to ba ban gas street lighting. Um, the banning of railways, I mean, there were only about 43 miles of railway in the whole of Italy at the time. They were in the northern states. Uh, railways enabled people to move around, to travel, to meet, to congregate in large numbers, uh, meet, exchange ideas. And this was seen as very, very important to spreading of revolution. 
uh, because you had all these people meeting uh, and exchanging ideas and learning how to cooperate. The same applied to gas street lighting. Gas street lighting allowed people to move around in dark at night, to gather in the dark, and they couldn't be properly seen and monitored by the authorities. Once again, you see this fear of revolution stalking uh, Rome, stalking Italy and stalking the papacy. <clears throat> um, so, and, and Cullen at the time, again, as I said, he's still with Gregory as one of his major advisors. But because they're very violent times, sorry, because they're very violent times, uh, Cullen is also very glad that he's an English subject. <laughs> it's one of the contradictions about um, Cullen. He's very glad that he's an English subject because the English state is the most powerful in the world. They meant British, of course, as anyone from Wales would appreciate. Um, <clears throat> but it was that sense of safety. Uh, and this is where you see a certain contradiction of entering into. Cullen was only ever a Roman Catholic. That was his sole concern, his sole interest. He had no interest in nationalism, wasn't even necessarily that particularly interested in which state belonged, as long as the Roman Catholic Church could reign. Total opposition to rationalism and nationalism. The reason for that is nationalism was specifically identified with Protestantism. Uh, modern nationalist theory was a product of the German Lutheran school of philosophy, Kant, uh, Fichte, Feuerbach, and particularly Hegel. Hegel brought God's divine will down to earth as the working out of the nation state, as part of the progress of history. So God revealed himself through history and the revelation of the nation state. That, of course, is a total contradiction to the papacy, where the papacy is revealed through, not the nation state. So you have two opposed concepts of what is divine will working here. And the two can't live together. One has to be, not the other. <clears throat> um, the, as far as Cullen is concerned and the Papacy is concerned, the Roman Catholic Church is the sole provider of, of social order in Europe. It's very simple. In 1832, uh, Cullen becomes rector of the Irish college, college and he introduces all his ideas into the training of Irish priests practicing for the priesthood in in, 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 the, in, in the Irish College in Rome. Very disciplined, highly Puritan, instills great ultramontane and scholasticism into them. In 1849, he returns to Ireland as the Archbishop of Armagh and Papal Legate. Uh, this is a year after the Young Ireland Rising, which he totally condemned. He abhorred violence, he abhorred nationalism. In 1852, he becomes translated to Dublin and although that's technically a step down, uh, because he still remains as papal legate, he trumps our master. So he's now in a position to start dictating in the Catholic Church in Ireland what should and should not happen. He loathes nationalism, he loathes liberal democracy, he loathes toleration, because in his opinion, it leads to uh, irreligion and false doctrine. Consequently, he loathes the old anti-Gallic church. And he sees this as his number one target when he comes back to Ireland, as to get rid of the, anti of the, of the old Gallic church. This is particularly expressed in his total opposition to the national school system, the Queen's colleges and charity reforms in the second half of the 19th century. So that is Cardinal Cullen in his prime. Uh, a very austere man, uh, total integrity, totally committed to what he was, uh, what he believed in, uh, single one track mind almost. So some of the factors that Cullen introduced when he returns. First of all, 1850, Synod of Thurles. Um, he wins a vote on the Queen's Colleges by one vote. He's very finely balanced his support amongst the bishops. The vote on the Queen's College, colleges would condemn them. These were the three colleges set up, Belfast, Cork, and Galway, to form the new uh, Queen's University of Ireland. They were deliberately designed by Peel in 1845 to provide 
an integrated university education to create a non-denominational sort of administrative class homegrown for Ireland. Colotopia polism. He wants a Catholic university, absolutely nothing else. Won't have anything to do with it. At the same time at the Senate, he strongly emphasizes that there is now a world onslaught on Rome. 1848 revolution in, in Rome led to the overthrow of the papacy. The papacy actually had to flee Rome. Yeah. Um, and Rome and Catholics need great protection from evil literature and Protestants. Uh, the reason for that will come on to in a second. He calls a halt to the tradition of mixed marriages whereby um, sons, sons were brought up as Protestant, uh, daughters were brought up as Catholics. So it had been a good quid pro quo. It had enabled mixing, integration, and a degree of harmony. Uh, sort of win-win situation. I think Cullen probably saw it more as a lose-lose situation. Um, his major concern, particularly in Ireland, was about Protestant proselytizing again. So he targeted that as a major campaign. He associated, as say, nationalism, liberal democracy, with Protestantism. They were all part of the same evil world conspiracy against Rome. Uh, Cullen also introduces a new internal discipline of the church, which it had probably long needed, regularizing the mass and the way mass was said, regularizing the sacraments, making sure priests were properly educated, no more semi-literate priests that had to be properly trained. Uh, bishops had to visit parishes and make sure that these priests were doing the job they were supposed to do. Um, again, something the church needed probably anyway, whether it was Gallic or not. So he reintroduces a tight discipline over the Roman Catholic Church. In particular, the reforms that he carries out throughout the rest of the uh, his, his period, when it took to 1878 when he dies. First point, no toleration of any liberalism, conciliation or working arrangements with anyone, with any of the nationalist movements, whether it was Young Ireland, whether it was Athenians, nothing to do with them. Same applies to working with the Majesty's government. Okay? Almost a total boycott. It was the Catholic Church, it was not going to be the Catholic Church, it was going to be its own sovereign institution within Ireland. This, this was his key idea. This was the battle that was also being fought out in Italy at the same time. So this is where he's bringing Catholic Italy to Catholic Ireland. Uh, in the 1860s, he raises a papal brigade to go and fight against the Risorgimento in Ireland. Um, from all accounts, they weren't much good, but the papal brigade didn't think much of the, the, uh, the, the papal troops either. Uh, <clears throat> this is to fight against the Risorgimento, which in 1860 really starts to take off, it really starts to, to get going. In the 1860s, there's the scandal of the St. Bridget's Orphanage, and this is where he really starts to show the steel hand of his Catholicism, his ultramontane Catholicism. There was a case there uh, that the orphanage took in uh, children of parents who were either unwanted or born out of wedlock or whatever. There was one child uh, of, of, of a Catholic girl. She sent the child to the orphanage. She later converted to Protestantism and wanted the child back. And the orphanage refused and Colin supported the orphanage in not letting the child go back. This was a very clear statement. In other words, he's saying, no, papal law comes first. This child was a Catholic child, all the Catholic child, that's it, end of story. Um, 1864, uh, the Syllabus of Errors. This was a uh, document we'll come on to in a second, which was, um, promulgated by uh, Pope Pius IX, in which Pope Pius IX utterly condemns as errors all, all the major features of modern liberal democracy. Um, and he denies the right of any material or state 
organization to have priority over the church. In fact, if I can just go down to uh, some of the syllabus of errors, perhaps the most important one there, number 80, the Roman pontiff can and ought to reconcile himself and come to terms with progress, liberalism, and modern civilization. That was the cardinal error of all cardinal errors. It left Catholics throughout Europe absolutely aghast. Almost split the Roman Catholic Church. Um, liberal Catholics started leaving the church in droves. There was a big resurgence of interest in what's known as the old Catholic Church, particularly in the Netherlands and Germany and Austria, where Catholics just said, no, look, the church has gone too far. It's lost touch with what it was supposed to be about. And so they went into this thing called the old Catholic Church, which I think now is in communication with the Anglicans. Cullen totally supports it. In 1870, he helps organize the First Vatican Council and supports the Pope in his declaration of infallibility. Now for centuries, the question of infallibility has been tacitly left unstated um, because everybody realized what a, what a hot potato that was. But Pius IX was insistent on infallibility and that Vatican I declared him infallible. Therefore, anything he says is infallible. Any encyclicals are infallible. You can't argue with it. Again, it's a logical extension of ultramontanism. And this is what Cullen is bringing back into Ireland. Um, 1865, there was a, a very famous incident in uh, Belfast when the, the new bishop had to be appointed. The popular choice for the new bishop was a chap called Denver, who had long been a priest in Belfast. He had a good reputation amongst uh, Anglicans, Presbyterians and Catholics in Belfast. He was well regarded. He was seen as being reasonable, tolerant, worked with the others, uh, didn't try to be too triumphalist about introducing Catholic churches and so on. He was seen as the ideal choice by nearly all his parishioners, par parish priests. However, Cullen was determined that he should not become bishop and wanted Doran, Dorian appointed, who was one of the new hardline ultramontanes that Cullen had been nurturing. And Cullen, because of his contacts in Rome, manages to get Doran in place. Doran is totally ultramontane. In 1865 in Dublin, Cullen bans the use of Catholics using mixed chapels in army barracks. They must have their own separate Catholic uh, barracks. 1867, disestablishment of the Church of Ireland. Cullen is very triumphant about this, has a Te Deum son. You know, if he'd have kept quiet, it would have been more politic. And it's also at this time, interestingly, again, coming back to Ulster, this is when Presbyterians start joining the Orange Order. Previously, it had been exclusively Anglican. Uh, in 1867, the Dublin Even Mail in an editorial uh, describes Irish Roman Catholics as stopping being Irish and becoming Roman. This is absolutely what Cullen wants. Absolute conformity to Rome. In 1850s, he worked with Cardinal Manning, who was an English convert uh, to Catholicism, to establish his Catholic university. And I'm going to speed up a little bit because I'm constantly running out of time. Um, in the 1850s, he organizes a major papal support against the Risorgimento in, in Italy, uh, <clears throat> which we'll come on to in a second. Um, and in fact, it's probably best if we give him the time back to come on to Italy and unification. This will show you why he goes down this hard line route. If you look at a map of Italy here, uh, <clears throat> and you look at Look at it in detail. There's 12 separate kingdoms or states, all independent. The northern states, particularly around uh, uh, Lombardy, Venetia, uh, were part of Austria-Hungary. Um, Piedmont, uh, the top left-hand corner here, was part of the kingdom of Sardinia. 
It was the dream of Irish nationalists anywhere in young Italy to get a united Italy, do away with all the separate states. Only then could Italy become modern. Only then could it start to develop economically and industrially. For example, each one of these states had its own weights and measures. Each one of these states had its own customs and taxes. Each one of these states had its own laws, easily trade and commerce. And it, it was chaos. It was very bad for business. And of course, what they were doing at the same time was looking at the greatest power in the world, Britain, and saying, what are the British done? Ha, the British have got a united kingdom. It's broken down all the internal barriers. Everybody speaks English. Uh, everybody has the same currency. Look at the way it's let forward. Look at the way it dominates the world. Britain was the role model for most of these uh, patriots. And right in the middle, from Rome up to Bologna, the Papal States. And the Pope, his sole um, monarch, absolute monarch in these states. And whilst the whole of Italy, particularly in the South, is regarded as very backward, very ignorant, uh, poorly administrated, the Papal States are often regarded as the worst by the Risorgimento. The Risorgimento really starts to make headway after 1846. 1846 to 1878, Pope Pius IX, who actually starts off as a bit of a liberal, he relaxes censorship laws, previously unheard of in the Papal States. 1848 turns him against that. 1848, he is deposed in the city of Rome. A Roman Republic is declared. Uh, democratic elections are held. Uh, Pius is forced to flee. Um, he's actually offered refuge by the British, although at the same time, the British government is supports in as much as it can the idea of the Risorgimento. Uh, um, and this is um, really where, where we come to the nub of the Italian question. Legacy of Napoleon was very strong. It haunted the whole of Europe. Uh, 1789, he chopped king's heads off, he chopped bishop's heads off, he got rid of the Roman Catholic Church throughout Europe. Uh, he'd invaded Italy, he'd imposed reforms on Italy, imposed his own rulers over Italy. <clears throat> but at the same time that it was resented by a lot of Italians, the educated Italian classes, particularly the educated middle classes, actually liked many of the individual reforms because it opened up careers and jobs to educated middle-class people that have previously been the privileged reserve of the aristocracy and the church. So now a well-educated uh, middle-class person without any aristocratic or clerical context could get rise to senior positions. This was liked, okay? but they didn't want the French telling them how to do it. Um, so the legacy of Napoleon lives on in the sum of the ideals of the Risorgimento. Also throughout Europe at this time, you have the rise of what was known as anti-clericalism. Anti-clericalism is not necessarily anti-Catholicism or anti-religion. It's the idea that clerics should keep out of politics. They don't know anything about modern politics. They don't know anything about modern economics or industry. They should keep to purely spiritual affairs. And almost without doubt, this is probably what most of the leaders of the Risorgimento were more anti-clerical than they were anti-Catholic. They became anti-Catholic as the Catholic Church resisted the reforms that they wanted, but they were not necessarily themselves totally anti-Catholic. The 1820 and the 1830 revolutions, um, the papacy, supports legitimacy and autocracy against the revolutionaries. For the, for the papacy, this was even sort of bizarre length that when the Poles in 1830-31, you know, a Roman Catholic country, the Poles rise up against the rule of the Tsar. The papacy supports the Tsar. Legitimate authority is more important. Keeps peace, keeps order. Uh, of course, at this stage, 
again, what it means is liberals, particularly Catholic liberals, start to turn against the papacy. Uh, in, in Italy, you had a particular uh, revolutionary sect known as the Carbonari. Uh, Carbonari after fires, they used to meet at night around the fire um, and hold their meetings there. They were liberal democratic revolutionary sects who were particularly vehement against the role of the Catholic Church in Italy, mostly in Northern Italy. 1848-49, the Pope's overthrow. Roman Republic is declared and Cullen is an eyewitness to all these events. There are some stories that he even saw a priest get his head hacked off during the revolutionary ferment. Um, here, you here you have Rome, the center of the Catholic world, Italy, the center, the home of Rome, Holy Roman Italy and Rome, the papacy totally overthrown, something that Cullen has devoted his life to. It's overthrown by revolutionaries uh, espousing liberal democracy and nationalism. In 1849, the Pope, uh, the Pope gets reinstated and uh, he and Cullen now become totally convinced of the folly of any toleration whatsoever of any revolutionary movements. Uh, it, total intolerance of liberalism, nationalism and rationalism, particularly science. Science now started to be seen as a serious threat to the revealed truth of the church because science proffered different ways of establishing truth. It was a threat. Uh, the real driving force behind the unification of Italy, though, didn't occur until the 1850s and 60s, uh, when Count Cavour uh, was the sort of, if you like, political genius. Uh, Mazzini was a major intellectual father figure. He's a refugee in London. Uh, here you have London, Protestant London, uh, being home to one of Rome's worst enemies. Mazzini was not necessarily, uh, he was certainly anti-clerical, he was not anti-religious. Uh, Garibaldi, who was the, becomes the great hero figure of the Risorgimento, as a military leader, he's an out-and-out -out atheist, no two ways about it. Uh, he's a great hero figure, and by the way, it's after him that the biscuits get made, the Garibaldi biscuits. When he visited uh, London in 1864, he brought the whole of the center of London to a standstill. He was the great popular hero of the English masses, or the British masses. They loved him. The same happened when he went to Manchester. He was mobbed everywhere. Um, of course, in Ulster, of the Protestants, he was a popular hero, not in Dublin. <laughs> Exactly the opposite, of course. Um, so I'm going to move. Sorry, let me just give you an idea. This is Count Cavour, died in 1861. He's a very cynical politician. He plays politics. He's really out to achieve the dominance of the House of Savoy uh, and the advances of the Kingdom of Piedmont. Uh, so he wants them to rule the whole of Italy. King at the time is King Victor Emmanuel. Um, not particularly interested in politics, he was more interested in his mistress. Um, he was very much a pawn of Cavour, but poor old Victor Emmanuel gets excommunicated by the Pope over the role of Cavour in the unification of Italy. Giuseppe Mazzini, he is the real intellectual figurehead. He is a major figure throughout the whole of Europe. He okay. finds refuge in London, spends most of his life there as a refugee. He does all the intellectual work. And Garibaldi, uh, say the hero figure, uh, the leader of the revolutionary forces, the rebel armies. And there's a famous uh, incident in Italian history called the Garibaldi's 1000, where he takes his, he's invaded Sicily uh, and he takes his thousand troops from Sicily to invade the Papal States. Uh, the British government provided the funds to get the ship to transfer the thousands. Um, British government was playing a, and it was conscious it was playing an awkward game. The British government had to support Risorgimento, number one, because most of the liberals did support it, ideally. 
Number two, it was so popular with the, the public opinion in Britain, you couldn't not support it. But behind the scenes, they were very wary about it. We didn't want to get too involved. Um, we wanted good relations with the Pope. They felt rather embarrassed at times uh, because they realized Ireland was predominantly Catholic. So they wanted to try and find some quid pro quo. And they were always offering to act as intermediaries. Okay, here you get, this, this is why poor old Victor Emmanuel gets excommunicated. <clears throat> um, okay, Mazzini is the leading intellectual figure in London. He's absolutely lionized by all the top intellects, uh, including Gladstone, uh, Lord Carlyle, uh, Lord Russell. They're all on intimate terms with Garibaldi. He's access to them, really the top figures in, in the British state. Um, all liberals, opinion, they not only see Italy as a cause celeb, they also see it as reflective of Ireland. Always been a big concern to the British state. Why was Ireland so economically backward? Why was it so poor? Um, after all, that was what Plantation of Ulster was far more about trying to develop it economically than anything to do with religion. Um, so they were making conscious connections between Italy's Catholic, Ireland's Catholic. This is a dangerous game to play, but popular opinion certainly sees it like that. Um, Garibaldi becomes the particularly hero heroic figure because he's so anti-Catholic as well as being a militant revolutionary. Um, in the 1850s, Cavour manipulates the King of Piedmont um, to lead the uh, movement for unification. And Cavour becomes obsessed with unification because it's going to make the House of Savoy, which is the Royal House of Piedmont, it's going to make them really big players on the European stage. Rule the whole of Italy. That's big time. In, uh, in 1859, uh, Cavour manages to annex Lomb Lombardy. In 1860, he annexes Parma and Moderna. In 1860, uh, the papal legations in Romagna the marches and the papal states are all annexed by, um, uh, uh, by Cavour and Piedmont. Also the two Sicilies. And in 1866, um, Venetia is um, a, 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 annexed. Garibaldi plays a key role here uh, as the heroic figure, but Cavour is the real genius. Cavour was prime minister of, of, of Piedmont, and it was the one functioning parliamentary democracy in uh, Italy before the unification. And as Prime Minister Piedmont, he began a whole series of reforms there, which included the total secularization of education, totally removed the church from all areas of education, secularized it, so no schools, no universities as Catholic, they're now going to be secular state, he introduced divorce and civil marriage, totally opposed by the Catholic Church, and then he nationalized all the church's property. Uh, um, Henry VIII didn't do nearly as good a job with the monasteries in England as Cavour did in Italy. Uh, so he's keen to strip the church from all of its major social and cultural roles, because what he's looking to do is he wants to create a new culture, an industrial culture, a scientific culture, a dynamic Italy, progressive, leave the past behind. And what he identifies the Catholic Church with is the medieval world. And of course, it's the 1854-58 bill to nationalize church property that leads to poor old King Victor Emmanuel being excommunicated by the Pope. Uh, Victor was rather upset about it because he actually sort of apologized to the Pope and said, look, not really my fault, you know, it's Cavour's pushing me to do this. Um, but as Piedmont takes over all the other states in Italy, so it introduces uh, Piedmontese rules and laws, first starting with the penal code and then introducing all the other reforms throughout the rest of Italy. Uh, in 1870, Rome itself, Rome and the territory, small territory surrounding Rome, were finally taken 
by the Risorgimento. Okay. Um, Rome becomes the capital of Italy. The Pope is incandescent with rage, joy, nothing he can do about it. Um, but he refuses to recognize the new king. He refuses to recognize the new state of Italy. He refuses to uh, recognize Rome as the capital of Italy. Uh, he effectively allows himself to be made a prisoner in the Vatican and rails openly against everything which happened, which is one of the reasons he calls the First Vatican Council uh, in 1869-70. And one of the reasons why he goes for infallibility. In, in a way, it's his sort of reaction, his retaliation against the unification of Italy and everything that it stood for. At the same time, remember, the British government supports the unification of Italy. British public opinion totally supports the Risorgimento. Um, Protestant Ulster does. Catholic Ireland doesn't, obviously. Um, Cullen, this is why Cullen, when he comes back to Ireland in 1850, first thing he does at the Synod of Thurles is to try and inculcate into them the sense of threat and danger that the worldwide Catholic Church is in. Why he introduces the ultramontanism, um, why he supports the syllabus of errors. Uh, he sees what's going on in Italy because he's a papal legate. He's in constant contact with Italy. He understands what's going on there. And he sees if you make, if you budge an inch in Ireland, okay, the same thing will happen in Ireland as happened in Italy. Therefore, you must go the other way. You must become totally aggressive uh, and you must create a total Catholic society, a Catholic society and a Catholic culture. Um, and <clears throat> meanwhile, back in Italy, um, <clears throat> the Pope has issued a series of um, encyclicals and statements. Uh, Nostra et Nubiscum on the false Protestant ideas and enemies. Uh, he has a real go of Protestants because I'll come on to that in a second. That would be the last point I make. Um, 1864, the syllabus of errors, 1871, uh, declares infallibility. And one of the things that particularly horrifies Catholics, as well as liberals and Protestants throughout Europe, was a, an event in 1858, which particularly signifies the route that the Catholic Church is going down. It's called the Mortara Affair in Bologna in 1858. The Mortara was a Jewish family. Uh, they had several children. The youngest child was very young and the youngest child became ill. Well, at the same time, plague was raging in Bologna. And a young maid who was a very devout Catholic got very fond of this child. And she was so scared that it was going to die of the plague and not being baptized would consequently go to hell, that she secretly went out, had the child baptized into the Catholic Church, and then brought it back to the Jewish family. She was fully expecting the child to die. The child didn't, it recovered. Once the church found out about this, the church took the child off the family. It said, no, it's a Catholic. Therefore, Catholic law, takes precedence because the Catholic Church is the Supreme Church, it's the supreme revelation of God's will on earth. Therefore, we have priority. So therefore, the Catholic Church took the child away from its Jewish family, brought the child up as a Catholic, and um, the child actually ended up becoming a priest. <laughs> but to give you an idea of the depth of feeling that was going on, the reaction that was taking place in the Catholic Church putting up all barriers to modernity, all barriers to compromise. Right. Um, Protestant GB and Ulster, well, <clears throat> as I've already said, there was uh, Ulster's, uh, Protestant Ulster was uh, very supportive. Um, and of course, once Cullen made sure that there's a, an ultramontane bishop covering uh, Belfast, that doesn't particularly help matters either. But also what was going on in, in Italy, another thing was uh, Protestant proselytizing, particularly led by British uh, Protestant organizations. Typical of these were the Bible Society, and the Evangelical Society. 
At the time, remember, most people saw the world through religious eyes. Yeah? And British Protestants in particular saw their success as directly linked to being Protestant and the virtues of Protestantism. Therefore, a lot of uh, British uh, supporters of Risorgimento also linked it to, linked to converting Italy to Protestantism. So if Italians could learn Protestant virtues, these were the virtues of modernity, progress, industry, and Italy would then really prosper. And to give you an example of this, the British and Foreign Bible Society in 1846 issued um, vernacular Bibles, sorry, vernacular Bibles were illegal in 1846. Um, so they were smuggled in and secretly distributed. In 1862, there were 30,000 Bibles were distributed in Italy, all in the vernacular. This was the first time it had happened in Italy. In 1866, 43,618 Bibles were distributed in the vernacular in Italy. In 1870, 320,000 Bibles were sold in Italy. So, although Protestantism doesn't take off, by, by the time you get to the 19th century, sorry, the end of the 19th century, there's only about 60,000 Protestants in Italy. But the link in devout Catholic minds between the resorgement of Protestantism, these evangelicals, was very, very strong. When Cullen's back in Ireland, one of the first targets of Protestants evangelizing, particularly in the west of Ireland. Uh, and this becomes a really serious bone of contention. It's um, perhaps the British Protestants would have been more diplomatic if they just simply stayed out of Italy because they almost certainly did more harm than they did good to themselves. Most Italians were not anti-Catholic. They regarded Catholicism as being part of Italy and being part of Italian. Uh, what they mostly didn't like was the clerical involvement in politics. Um, <clears throat> 1866, there was a particular stir, it was what's known as the Massacre of Valletta, um, where a, a Catholic priest stirred up a mob of Italian Protestants uh, against a, a Protestant meeting. Uh, six people were killed as a, a, in this, 28 arrests. Um, they were all convicted, but then uh, went on to win their appeals. Again, it's another one of those great symbolic events that resonates throughout Europe. At the same time, uh, because of the Catholic react and the Pope's reaction to the Resorgimento, this makes the Pope an increasingly hate figure in Great Britain. Particularly after the Mortari affair, that really stirred up the masses. But the, the British government, whilst it was very active diplomatically and politically, tried to steer clear of things as much as possible. It did try to help the papacy where it could. It had a Quite a respect for the papacy because um, it was a venerable institution. It did provide a certain degree of stability and order, and it didn't want to upset too many things in Ireland. Um, so at the same time, they offer uh, a ship to help take um, Pius uh, to sanctuary, uh, probably in Malta. Uh, and they were very conscious, I'd say, to play down the uh, uh, their role, particularly in Ireland, because Cullen now had come back to Ireland, was full scale on the war path, and absolutely no um, toleration now. Um, it was open warfare. But do remember, Cullen still hates nationalism. He wants nothing what to do with Young Ireland. He wants nothing what to do with the Fenians, condemns them totally because he associates them with the Italian Carbonari and then the Risorgimento. So he sees them as enemies. And this is the important point. Colin wants a Catholic world. He's not really interested in the politics. You might almost say he's naive about it. But he's determined there'd be a Catholic island uh, and that should reign absolute. This is why after Colin dies in 1878, uh, Catholic churches 
distant even from home rule. It's only when Parnell agrees to what to um, let the church have total control of education and a major say on the candidates, so the home rule candidates, that he gets the church's backing. In 1896, well, the, the papacy started to get its own backing a little bit. Um, the papal bull uh, Apostolica Curi, which claims that all Anglican uh, orders are invalid. That's a sort of two fingers in your face. 1901, Roman Catholics are told not to attend memorial services for Queen Victoria in Ireland. 1901, there's a curial directive. The Protestants are to be regarded as heretics and therefore cannot be godparents when you're Roman Catholics. In 1910, Cardinal Logue will attend King George V's coronation because he is a Protestant. 1910-11, you get the Nate to Mary and the McCann case. The McCann case was infamous at the time, because, particularly because of the Third Home Rule Bill going on. And again, it was one of those cases where the Catholic Church raises its laws and its sovereignty over the laws of the land. Um, Agnes and Alexander McCann were mixed marriage. Agnes was a Presbyterian, Alexander was Catholic. They had two children, uh, seemed to be happily married. Um, but then after Nature Mary is introduced, which the children says children must be brought up as Catholic, of mixed marriages, uh, the local priest comes along, says the children, um, because the marriage, the marriage wasn't properly sanctified in the Catholic Church, uh, the children are not uh, properly uh, sanctified, therefore they must get remarried in the Catholic Church and, and make the promise to bring the children up Roman Catholic. Um, Agnes says no. Um, Alexander McCann and the two children and all the household furniture disappear overnight. This caused absolute mayhem in Ireland at the time. The Protestants naturally went on the war path but they also went on the warpath in England and Scotland. Major meetings in uh, London, um, in uh, Edinburgh, in Manchester, in Belfast. It, it even forces the, the government to make an amendment to the Third Home Rule Bill uh, to placate the Protestants um, so that such a thing can't happen. Again. But for the Protestants, what they now see, and this is why religion is so important with Home Rule, it's not the most important thing. Economics was the most important thing. The second most important thing was economics. But this represented to them is this mystical power that they had no control over, that was totally external to them, uh, that operated without any rational rhyme or reason that they could understand outside of the laws of the land and external the sovereignty of the laws of the land, that it could simply act in this way. And that made Protestants very conscious in 1910, 1911, that home rule would be Rome rule. Because unfortunately, the Irish Parliamentary Party, not only did they say they couldn't see anything wrong with it, they even objected to the amendments that the government was forced to introduce. So home rule party totally supported the Catholic Church in this thought it was okay. What again that showed was by now you created an Irish Catholicism that was its own total culture. It wasn't necessarily nationalist because the Roman Catholic Church was still wary of nationalism. It was only if the Catholic Church was going to be in control of certain social and cultural institutions was it prepared to go along with them. They made that very clear. The Home Rule realized that they were not going to get anywhere unless they had the Catholic Church on site. Okay. But the McCann case symbolized this sort of universal mystical power that Catholicism seemed to be able to uh, convey that would simply make all Protestants second class citizens. Okay, and um, I'll leave it there. I'm conscious that I've overrun my time. I'm sorry, typical academic on a hobby horse. So, Jason. Thank you. Thanks very much, James. And we have indeed overshot our time. So um, what I'll do is I'll just ask one question, really, which will hopefully 
uh, bring us to a natural conclusion. And my question to you, James, is that how important is it in this the, the centenary year of partition? You alluded to this at the very beginning, but how important is it in this the centenary year of partition to be thinking about partition in the international context? Um, but very important um, because if you're going to look at the uh, the international context. Uh, you, you take Catalonia and Spain. Okay? The EU didn't want any, didn't want Catalonian independence. Uh, they wanted things to remain the way, the way they are. Internationally, people don't like messing around with borders. It's messy. Okay? Um, the Republic of Ireland wants to keep the border. It's aware of the problems that having uh, a, a United Ireland would have. It couldn't create the state that it did, uh, and it would have to completely redefine itself if there was a united Ireland. That's too big a problem. Okay. Um, no, the modern international order wants to try and keep things as stable as possible. Okay. International orders do not like change. They like to keep things straightforward. Okay. Um, so if you were looking at it, um, you could also look at Scotland as well. The EU would not welcome a change of Scotland vis-a-vis -vis the UK. That would create far too many problems, not least for Scotland. They reckon it would take about 10 years to disentangle Scotland from the rest of the UK. Um, and then it would then have the effect of Scotland on Northern Ireland, then the effect of Northern Ireland on the Republic of Ireland. No, don't want it. You must always look at the international dimension. At the moment, there is a resurgence of um, what you might call um, ethnic nationalisms as a reaction against over internationalization in the global economy, which has meant that a lot of power has shifted from nation states to big multinational corporations. Uh, but at the same time, uh, so you see Scottish nationalism, for example, is a response to that. Um, but an independent Scotland would be even easier meet for the big global multinationals to eat up. So, is that enough? <laughs> that, that's more than enough. Uh, and the reason why I ask that, uh, just for, for me to finish, is I read an article at the weekend in the Irish Times uh, by Charles Townsend, who's just published a new book about partition, and he was making the argument that Sinn Féin have to bear some of the responsibility because they were involved in the negotiations. And I followed, it took me down a rabbit hole of a huge online debate then about who was ultimately responsible for partition. So I thought tonight was extremely refreshing then just to put that in the international context, and I think it bodes well. Uh, Wait, can, I, can, the... I, can I just come back to one thing on that? Yeah. If, if you ever read the Irish Convention, 1917, 1918, which was the final, final, ultimate attempt to get all island settlement. Um, they reported in 1918, they found agreement on absolutely everything bar one question. And that was would fiscal responsibility in a home rule parliament lie in Dublin or London. Ulster industry could not accept coming under Dublin fiscal control. Its industry needed to be within the rest of the UK's fiscal ambit. That was the only thing, finally, they could not agree on. Sorry. Okay. You're okay. I think on that note, we're going to bring it to a close, James. So once again, for me, and on behalf of the Lennon Hall Library, thank you very much. And we'll definitely be doing this again on a, on a different topic. We'll definitely have you back. Um, and the numbers have held up. It's always a sign of a good event whenever the numbers hold up and they don't disappear halfway through. So, folks, I hope everybody's enjoyed this. Um, we'll be publishing our May program of events very soon. So do keep in touch with the Linen Hall Library's website. And I hope to see some of you, if not all of you, um, back at some of our future online events. And just to remind you, this will be going on to our YouTube channel in the coming days. I'm conscious that there was a lot to take in there and you might want to listen back to this again and indeed share it with your, with your friends, etc. So thank you very much um, and I hope to see you all again soon.